Hi everyone, welcome to the Buy Properly webinar on cryptos, NFTs, and and hopefully some real estate since it is a Buy Properly webinar. Uh, I hope you guys are all as excited and curious as I am today uh, to listen to what Professor Jen has to say. Um, so I'm just waiting a few more minutes for um, for people to trickle in. And meanwhile, while we are waiting, let me just uh, run a poll and see what the customers think here. So where is everybody investing their extra savings? And with December coming in, I'm hoping some of you would get some bonus um, from, from your jobs, businesses, etc. cetera. And, and I'm already thinking about how you will go about investing. As it is between December and Feb, people think a lot about investing. November and maybe early December, it's more about spending when you're buying your holiday gifts. Um, but let's see what people think. Okay, we'll give people 10 more seconds and then we close out the poll. So if you just joined, there's a poll you would see on the screen. We are trying to get a sense of where people are uh, putting their money in. We've not put real estate in there uh, in particular because um, we decided to keep that out and see outside of real estate, how are you spending or putting your money into different investment products? Awesome, so with that, I will end the poll and let me share results to see how. Okay, so not surprisingly, 60% is in stocks, uh, followed by mutual funds. I'm guessing it's probably through your RRSPs that you are anyways invested in mutual funds. Um, okay, so we have people who have invested in cryptocurrencies. That's awesome. And people making ESG investments. Um, the latter two, I'm really curious on. Um, where you guys invest. So if you could paste in the chat, people who indicated they have been investing in cryptocurrencies and ESGs, what their um, investment vehicle of choice is in these areas. I would be super, super curious to learn. And I'm sure some of the other people in the audience would also be eager to learn. Awesome. With that, let's start the session and I would like to uh, welcome Professor Chinmay Jain. Um, Dr. Chinmay Jain is a renowned professor of finance at the State University of New York and he's most importantly an active investor in stocks, bonds, options, real estate, um, all things um, all things crypto. He's an authority on digital currency and art and of course Bitcoin. Um, so the intention of this um, a session or webinar is to one learn about uh, cryptocurrencies and NFTs for those of us who are uninitiated, uh, but also link it back to how we can include something like a crypto NFT, which seems like very high risk when they come in. And by the time we realize that they maybe are not as high risk or are getting mainstream, it is actually already expensive and not accessible, as is the case with Bitcoin. Uh, Professor Jen um, has research interests in short selling, market microstructure, financial reg regulations, and so on. He has a PhD from University of Memphis, US, and um, an engineering degree in industrial engineering from Indian Institute of Technology. He's also received the Financial Review Best Paper Award uh, for his research paper on short selling. Um, the impact of SEC Rule 201. So welcome, Professor Jen. Um, and I'm really excited to share uh, and learn from you what you have here. Uh, thank you so much, Kushbu, for a great introduction. So I've been teaching about cryptocurrencies to my students for the last four years. And actually, I've been teaching one whole course on cryptocurrencies. I've done that a few times. So it'll be kind of hard to condense everything in this 40-minute session, but I'll try my best. So I'm going to share my screen now so you can look at my slides here. So what I want to do first is give you an introduction of what blockchain is. And uh, I'll give you an example of Bitcoin to start. 
So generally, when you go to like a grocery store and when you swipe your card, what happens is that uh, your bank will check whether you have money in your account or not, and then the transaction will get validated. What happens with uh, Bitcoin blockchain is that anyone can validate your transaction. So anybody who's running the Bitcoin node can validate your transaction. So it is a distributed ledger. So I'll show you a screen here. Uh, if you all see it here, these are the number of Bitcoin nodes right now, 14,233. I took the screenshot uh, yesterday. So you can see that anyone throughout this world can validate my transaction. So these are miners who are running a copy of the Bitcoin ledger. So, uh, so I'll talk a bit about what mining is as well. So this is a distributed ledger. And also another property of blockchain is that the data is stored as a chain of blocks. So if you see this diagram here, so we have this data in blocks and each date block is linked to the previous block using the hash. So I'll show you what a hash is. So I'm going to send a link to all of you if you want to test it out and see what a hash looks like. So here's the link. So now if you type any data in this block, for example, Chinme sends one Bitcoin to Kushmi. So there's a hash for this data here, right? And if I make any change to this hash, let's say I make it two Bitcoin, the hash of this block changes. So let's say I had this di I have this diagram here. Let's say the data is stored in Bitcoin blockchain in these blocks. And one of the transaction is that Kushbu sends one Bitcoin to Chinmay and the hash of first block is H1. And the second block is linked through block one uh, that in, in a way that the first line of the second block points to the hash of the first block. Now, if I try to change this to let's say two Bitcoin here, the hash will change to H1 star and then this link will get broken, right? So this is how the cryptography secures transaction in Bitcoin blockchain. So if you try to change any data, in, 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 a, in the blockchain, the links between the blocks will get broken. So, so I can be assured that if somebody sent me a transaction of one Bitcoin, it is not going to get reversed. While when I go to a merchant and I swipe my credit card and tomorrow I can dispute the transaction and the merchant may not get the money. So this is one property of Bitcoin blockchain that is immutable. So that is what makes it trustless. So I just talked about the hash function. You, should, you could all look at it. And another thing that comes into play when we talk about Bitcoin blockchain is public key and private key. So when I send money to Kushbu, I do not put her name in the blockchain. What I put is the public key associated with Kushbu. So again, what you can do is you can copy this link uh, that I'm going to send to you in the chat window. Um, and see what the public key and the private key looks like. So here, what happens is I randomly generate a private key and then I get a public key associated with it. So public key is like your email address. You don't mind sharing your email address with people and your private key is like your password. So if you have some Bitcoin and you want to spend them, then you need the private key associated with the public key. And if you want to send Bitcoin to someone, you want to know their public key. So interesting thing here is that whenever we are tr trying to create a public key, private key pair, we don't need to check if somebody is using that pair already or not. And the reason is that the number of pairs possible is if you take all the grains of sand on earth, and then if you create another earth for each grain of sand, and if you take all those earths and planets, and if you count the number of sands of grains on those planets, so number of public key and private key pairs possible is much, much larger than that. So when we try to create an email address, some, it gives us an error that email address is not available, but in case of public key and private key pair, you can see that we don't need to check if the public key and private key are being used by somebody else or not. 
So what happens now, uh, so Christopher is not seeing the link. Uh, is everybody able to see the link that I'm sending in the chat I window? See the link, yes. I Michelle says no. Sunny says no. So I'm sending it to the host and panelists, right? Yeah. Uh, so look yeah. in the chat window. Is somebody else able to not see it? Not only hosts and panelists. Um, can you let me let me do this for you? Okay, some people are able to, able to see it, so. Yeah, let me, let me send it to everyone. It's okay. Okay, so hopefully now everybody can see it. So, so what happens when I do a Bitcoin transaction is, I broadcast a message to the whole Bitcoin blockchain. And the person who gets to add the block will add that transaction their block and that block will get added to the Bitcoin blockchain. Now you might say that who gets to add the block? So the answer to that question is a person who solves a math problem. So it is very random who will add the next block and it depends on your computational power. If you have large computational power, you have a larger chance of adding a block in the Bitcoin blockchain. So these are some uh, tidbits about Bitcoin mining. So each block is about one megabyte in size, which means it can contain three to 4,000 transactions. And every time a miner adds a block, they get a reward of 6.5 Bitcoin. So they are mining this, these blocks because they get this reward and that's why they are doing it. And so far 18.9 million Bitcoin have been mined already. And the total possible number of Bitcoin that can be produced is 21 million. So about 90% of all the Bitcoins have been mined and about 2.1 million are left to be mined. So the interesting thing, and every 10 minutes on average, a block gets added to the Bitcoin blockchain. So I'll also send you one more link to look at the Bitcoin blockchain. So if you go on blockchain.com, and if you click here, the great thing about Bitcoin blockchain is you can see all the transactions here. So it is a public blockchain. You can see all the transactions that are happening. So what you can do is you can look at the very last block that was added to the Bitcoin blockchain. So if you click on this link and you scroll down a little bit, you will see all the latest blocks. If you click on the very last block, you can see that how many transactions were added to that block, 2,921. And you can also see what was the award that was given to the miner, 6.25 Bitcoin. And you can also see that the, all the fees that the people pay for transactions also gets paid to the miner. And the very first transaction of any block is the Coinbase transaction, which means that the Bitcoin reward that gets paid to the miner. So in this case, the reward was 6.25 Bitcoin plus the fees that were paid to the miner uh, for all the transactions. So you can look at any block in the Bitcoin blockchain. So just to show you, I, I wanted to look at all the richest public keys on Bitcoin blockchain. So the one that I found was from an exchange called Binance. So if you copy this public key, you, so which is, so I just Googled the richest uh, Bitcoin public keys. So the first one I found was from an exchange, uh, Binance. And then I can put that public key here in the Explorer. And then it will tell me how many, what transactions have been made to this particular key. So I'll just copy this public key and I'll paste this in the uh, Explorer and I'll press enter. Then I click on Bitcoin and you can see how many transactions have been made to this public key, 667. So generally you cannot see, I cannot see Kushbu's bank account and see who, who has transferred money to her, like who has she transferred money to. But here in a Bitcoin blockchain, I can exactly see that how many transactions have been done uh, with this public key. What I see is the public keys. I do not see the names here. So, so any transaction that is in Bitcoin blockchain, 
because it is a public blockchain, you can see it uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain uh, using a blockchain explorer. So any questions anybody has, Akushbu, you have so far for me? Um, no, but when you are doing, say, financial transactions, how do you ensure that um, the people influencing the blocks are not bad actors, for example? Um, just yeah. having computational power shouldn't be enough to influence um, the state or add information that may or may not be validated by somebody else. Okay, so let's say I was the miner who added the last block. So I will add the block to the blockchain and everybody else will see that I've added a block. They will also check if all the transactions are valid or not. Only then they'll make a copy of the last block to their blockchain. So whenever a block gets added by a miner, everybody else also validates the transactions to make sure I'm not putting some transactions that are not valid in the, in the new block that I've added. But in a group of random strangers, if you put in a transaction, how will I validate that what you're putting in is correct? So when I put a transaction in a block, each transaction has an input. So I have to reference another transaction where money was sent to me. So let's say if I'm trying to send one Bitcoin to you, I have to reference another transaction where one Bitcoin was sent to me and that transaction must not have been spent by me either. So everybody else will reference that transaction that I'm adding to my transaction and they will make sure I have no, I'm not trying to double spend or I have not used that money already. So I'll reference transaction from another block, which might be one year ago. So because you can go through all the blocks, you can check if the transaction is valid or not. Let's open the floor to see if anybody in the audience has a question. Um, remember, this is a new area, so no question is a novice question. I already asked a few novice ones. Uh, so feel free to ask if you have any questions at all. Looks like we are okay for now. Go ahead. Okay. So does anybody know how Bitcoin derives its value? So why is it uh, 55,000 today in US dollars and not 5,500? Like how do you model the price of Bitcoin? So, so I have a question from Sharad though that I can see right now. So anybody can start their own node. So you can download a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain on your computer. You need that hard disk space, uh, but whether you will get to add a new block uh, is, is, is going to be hard because your computational power is going to be very, very low. So if you will solve the next math problem, uh, the chances of that is going to be very low. So Kushbu, do you know how Bitcoin derives its value or how, so like generally when we talk about stocks or bonds, we look at future cash flows and then we discount them to find the price of the stock. But what about Bitcoin? How will you value the bit, uh, Bitcoin? Like a scarce commodity that has a finite supply? Yeah, so there are two ways I can think of how you will, so you're right that how you will value Bitcoin. One is you can see it as digital gold. Right, so let's say the gold's market cap today is $10 trillion and the market cap for Bitcoin is $1 trillion. So let's say you think that more people will move from physical gold to digital gold. So if I think that 1 trillion will flow from gold, physical gold to Bitcoin, then the market cap of Bitcoin is going to be $2 trillion. Then I can divide the number of Bitcoin in existence and see what would be the price of Bitcoin at that point. And there's another way to value scarce assets, some like gold or silver. What people do is they look at the amount of gold that is in existence today. So that is called a stock of gold. And then there's something called as flow that based on the amount of gold that is being mined today, how long it will take for me to create the stock of flow that exists today. And based on that number, they value gold and silver. 
and people have seen that these models work fairly well. So they have tried to apply this model to Bitcoin. So they look at how many Bitcoins are in existing, existence today. There are 18 Bitcoin, are 18 million Bitcoin are in existence today. And on average, every 10 minutes, I'm adding 6.25 Bitcoin. So I have a ratio, stock to flow ratio. So based on that, they model the price for Bitcoin. And you can see this thin green line is what the model predicts the price of Bitcoin to be. And this colorful line, like rainbow color line, tells you the actual Bitcoin price. So you can see it tracks it fairly well. And based on that, the model says that in 2025, the Bitcoin should be priced around a million dollars. So if we expect this model to continue working well, we can see the price of Bitcoin to be around a million dollars, but we don't know if this model will continue to work well or not. So that's the question we'll find out in 2025 if the price of Bitcoin is $1 million at that point. So do you want me to move and talk about other coins, other tokens? What would you like me to talk about next? I think there's a question. So it says, where can I find those from Sharad again? Where can I find those math problems? If I want to take a shot at those math problems, um, if I want to take a shot, I don't know, I can't see the rest of the question. But basically, where can I find those problems? So these are not math problems that you solve on using pen and paper. These are problems that you solve using computational power. So I'll show you an example here what mining is. So let's say there's the block, the next block has this data that Chinmay sends one Bitcoin to Kushbu. Right? And now by clicking on this button, I'm mining. So when I click on mine, what happens is that this program is finding a number which is called as a nonce, such that the hash of the block number, the nonce and the data fits a particular format, which in this case is four zeros at the front. Do you see four zeros at the front? So if I change the data, sends two Bitcoin to Kushbu, I'll have to mine it again. And the nonce in that case is going to be 102,465. So right now, uh, if you go to that link again that I showed you before, click on home here and I, I click on the latest data block that was mined. And then I can see the hash of the latest block. So right now the difficulty of the math problem is based on is based based off the number of zeros that are in front of the hash. So I cannot count it really right now, but let's say they are on 20. So right now the difficulty of the math problem is set that whenever you are trying to find a nonce, you have to make sure that the hash has 20 zeros, 20 leading leading zeros in front of it. So if tomorrow, let's say the computing power of blockchain increases the network increases and people are able to solve this problem every three minutes, the network will adjust the difficulty itself and it will say you need to have 21 zeros uh, leading zeros in the hash. So it's all about finding a hash that fits a certain criteria, which is the number of leading zeros uh, that the hash has. So, so you can also see what was a nonce. Nonce for the last block was this number. So somebody found a nonce such that the hash had 20 leading zeros. So that's what the math problem is. You're not going to solve it using uh, your pen and paper, but your computing power will do it for you. Got it. So how does this now connect back to practical applications? Yeah, so... So Bitcoin started, uh, so, so Bitcoin is a payment token or you can call it store of value token. So it does not have any utility. All you can do is transfer money to somebody in the form of Bitcoin, right? So, it is, so the scripting language that Bitcoin uses is called as Turing incomplete, which means you can only do transactions. Then, and also then so many other payment tokens came about. So Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, because there are like 7,000 tokens in circulation today. So you might ask, why do I need so many tokens or so many cryptocurrencies? Why is Bitcoin not enough? 
So Bitcoin was only able to handle a couple of thousand transactions every, every 10 minutes, right? Because one block has a limitation on size. So some other cryptocurrencies came which could do larger transactions, but uh, then came something called as Ethereum, which allowed you to also program the transactions. So with Bitcoin, we can only do transactions, send money to somebody, but with Ethereum, you can actually write applications on top of it, and then you can program how transactions will be done. And that is called a smart contract. So Ethereum allows you to write smart contracts on a blockchain. And I'll give you an example of that. So let's say uh, you and I had to do a, make a bet on tomorrow's weather. So let's say Kushbu says tomorrow there'll be snow in Toronto, and I say there'll be no snow tomorrow. So we can bet $50. And what we can do is either we can trust each other or we can like have a mutual friend. We can give $50 to the mutual friend and tell the mutual friend that if it snows tomorrow, give $100 to Kushbu. If it does not snow tomorrow, give it to me. Now in this case, we have to trust the third party. What if the third party or the friend keeps the money and runs away? So what you could do is you could write this contract on a blockchain and you know that uh, data on a blockchain is immutable. So once the contract has been written, it cannot be reversed. So you can write this con smart contract on a blockchain and then let that contract do the work, do the work that the blockchain can check the weather tomorrow. And if the weather is, is snow, then the money will get transferred to the wallet or address of Kushbu. Otherwise, I get the money. So I can give you some examples of what are different types of tokens that are being used. So you can generally classify cryptocurrencies in three categories. So first one I talked about was Bitcoin. This is a payment token or store of value token. And then we have security tokens, so which means now corporations can issue uh, equity or debt as a token on blockchain. And the third one is a utility token, which means we can program decentralized application on Ethereum blockchain or any blockchain that allows us to write smart contracts. So, so generally what we see in the stock market is that people try to raise money by issuing stocks, right? So we saw Rivian had an IPO uh, earlier this month. They issued stock at a price of $78. So what people are doing in the blockchain uh, is that they are trying to come up with these decentralized projects. And uh, these for these decentralized projects, they're issuing their own tokens. And when they raise some capital using this uh, issue of tokens, they build applications on top of Ethereum blockchain. So this is called as initial coin offering. So people are raising money using uh, coin offerings, using blockchain, and they are building new projects. So, and most of the projects have been built on Ethereum blockchain. And so far, $27 billion have been raised using blockchain. So if you want to see different ICOs that have happened till today, you can go on this website called icobench.com. So if you click on icobench.com, you get to see all the ICOs that have taken place. Jimmy, could we as a startup raise money through an ICO? So the answer to that question would be that you only raise money through an ICO if you're using blockchain for one of your projects. Okay. If you are not using blockchain for your project, then raising money through ICO is not going to be useful. So that would be the answer I would like to give. So there have been a lot of frauds uh, in the space because this is a new space. So people have run away with the money. They have uh, like raised capital. But from investing point of view, it has been, uh, people have received good returns. So since 2017, 4,000 ICOs have taken place. I'm talking about a study here. And the study showed that the average return that an investor made by investing in ICOs is higher than 79%. While the, uh, the comparable number for IPOs in the stock market would be about 15 to 20%. So if we invest in ICOs, you can make good return as well. So, so I want to tell you a bit about 
how do you decide which ICO to invest in? So research has shown what makes an ICO a good ICO. So like, for example, here, you first need to see whether the project is solving a real world problem or not. So the way the ICOs raise money is they, they have a white paper and you need to read the white paper and see if the project is solving a problem or not. So for example, are they making voluntary disclosure in the white paper or not? Another example, if the project uh, is going to be successful or not, if the issuer has done VC funding in the past or not, if the CEO of the company has experience as in computer science or not. So research has looked at past ICOs and they have tried to figure out what makes an ICO a successful ICO or not. So I'll quickly try to jump on uh, some examples. So again, these are some examples of fraud as well. So there was a company that raised close to half a million dollars and they just ran away with the money. There was another firm that raised $15 million and they were promising 13 times return within a month. So these are some red flags. You look at these numbers and you can see that it doesn't make sense. How can I make 13 times returns within a month? And I also done my own research and I saw that people try to take advantage of this blockchain hysteria. For example, there's a company called Long Island IST Company and they changed their name to Long Blockchain Corporation and they had nothing to do with blockchain. And all these companies that did this, you can see their stock price shot up within a few days of changing the name, like more than 100% on average. But within a few months, it went back down. So people tried to take advantage of the blockchain history. So again, like you were asking me that, can we raise money using, uh, uh, using uh, blockchains, right? So one is you can do an ICO if you have, uh, you can issue tokens if you have a blockchain project in mind. But even otherwise, if you want to just like raise debt or equity for your firm, you can do that on blockchain as well. So that saves you money. So there have been some debt issues on the blockchain. For example, European Investment Bank raised $100 billion. A bank in China raised $3 billion in debt. So the, what are the advantage of doing this? The advantages are that transactions are fully traceable. So if I am buying debt for your firm, I can easily trace my transaction on the blockchain. And this is all being done on Ethereum blockchain. So you can see all the transaction. And also if the costs go down for the issuance. So if the costs are going down for you, it is helpful for the investor as well, right? You can pass on the benefits of issuing debt on the blockchain that you're getting to your investors. So can I- you quick, yeah. detail that piece out, Professor Jen? Like um, for an issuer, how would the costs be lower or if you use blockchain versus regular debt issuance? So for example, like I'll just give you one example that clearing and settlement process in the US is very slow. So it takes two years, two days for settlement. So if I'm buying a stock today, I do not actually receive it in my account for another two days. So it's a very slow process and it is costly process. But in, in the blockchain, the transactions are going to happen in real time. It's going to reduce your settlement cost. And you also do not have counterparty risk because you know that once the smart contract is there in place. I know the money has been sent to the contract that I'm going to receive it. So counterparty risk is also very low. So these would be some, uh, some examples of how your cost is going to be lower. Yeah. So I know we do not have a lot of time we, and we can take some questions in the end, but I quickly want to give you an example of a decentralized finance application. So right now, if I want to borrow money, what I need to do is I need to go to a bank and it's a lengthy process. I need to go through a, a centralized party, but you can do all that in the blockchain. So for example, there's a protocol for lending and borrowing on the blockchain, it's called as Compound. So what you can do with Compound is, let's say if I had Ethereum in my account, I could use Ethereum as a collateral and borrow US dollar coin. And uh, when I pay back my loan, I get my Ethereum back. So the limitations of doing this right now is you can only use digital assets on blockchain to use as collateral. 
So, if, but in future, if I could have the deed of my house on the blockchain, I could use the house as a collateral. So I think it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen right away. But in future, we would be able to use physical assets as collateral on the blockchain uh, once we are able to put the deeds on the blockchain. So you can also earn interest. So let's say if you have US dollars in your account and if you want to earn interest, if you go to a bank, the bank will give you less than 1%. But if you go to one of these protocol, for example, there's a protocol Aave, AAVE, and if I have US dollars, I can earn an interest of $3.05. So all I need to do is deposit US dollar coin, which is a stable coin uh, uh, in, onto this protocol. And every 13 seconds, I earn interest. So every time a Ethereum block gets mined, which is about 13 seconds, I get interest on it. While what happens with the bank is I have a lockup period of a year if I have to buy a CD of a year length and I only get less than 1% in return. So I can make a much higher return on these decentralized uh, applications that have been built on top of Ethereum. So this is another example of a decentralized application. So if there's any question, maybe we can answer that. Uh, So if, yeah, I can share these slides with you, Kushbu, if you yeah. want. And, uh, yeah, actually, I don't know how much we will be able to cover more on the crypto, because I know you want yeah. to get into NFTs as well. So maybe, and I don't have a poll on this, but maybe if if the attendees can express interest, we could do a more detailed, like a half-day workshop or a master class where okay. you can get into actually more details. So if people are interested, can you just repeat reply into the chat board saying you're interested to do a, a three-hour workshop masterclass kind of a session with more details on this. Yeah, just reply with interested in a workshop session. So meanwhile, I'll answer Christopher's question. Yeah. He's asking, should I invest in a blockchain stock or directly sure. into a crypto coin? So yeah, buying a crypto coin directly definitely is more speculative uh, than uh, buying a blockchain stock. And again, it depends on what you mean by blockchain stock. If you're buying a mining stock like Riot, that's also very risky. But if you're buying, let's say Amazon, some people call Amazon also a blockchain stock. They are blockchain ETFs and you will definitely find Amazon there. So uh, I have a slide at the very end. Uh, it shows you some ETFs that do invest in blockchain stocks. So BLOK, BLCN. So if you look at these ETFs, you can look at what are the stocks that are using blockchain technology. So again, uh, buying cryptocurrency is more speculative for sure but you can get much higher return. So it all depends on your risk appetite. That would be my answer to the question. Okay, yeah, it looks like a lot of people are interested. So you might follow this session up um, and with, with a proper masterclass session, which is longer, where we can answer more questions. if. Based on your availability, Professor Chair. Uh, of yeah, course. Sure, I'll be happy to do There's it. I'm all... very excited. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I'm just saying I have been very excited uh, about the space uh, for the last four years. That's why I teach this course. I'm invested as well. <laughs> like I bought. Yeah, some you can share with the audience that you've made tons of money with that because <laughs> you invested in Bitcoin long, long ago. And you saw. Well, not that long ago. I invested in 2017, but yeah. That's four years that was, ago. So it, yeah. it was at a different scale than it is right now. <laughs> yeah, that's true for sure. Yeah. So I think there's one question, which is what will be the intersection of crypto and fractional ownership? Um, I think, Chinmay, maybe you could part, talk part of it. I can then tell and share with the audience what we are thinking and why we thought it makes sense to educate the audience on this. Because at our end, we are thinking about 
um, bringing that piece in, especially starting with a with a debt fund, and it's interesting that you actually brought an example of how you could be um, issuing debt on um, on a blockchain, keeping track, earning interest literally every 13 seconds. So we are trying to bring a deal like that for the audience at our end. That was our big intersection, but maybe you could speak a little more on how crypto enables fractional ownership. So again, uh, one advantage that I see is the traceability. So like, uh, how do you trace the ownership? And that's very easy to see on the, on the blockchain. Uh, and, and for the same reason now, NFTs are getting popular as well. So for example, you can have NFTs for physical assets. So like once you can put house deed or the title of a car on the blockchain, you can sell them as NFT. Or let's say if you have a rare item, like for example, watches. So you can have a certificate as an NFT on the blockchain. So when you go to sell the watch, you don't have to prove that this is a genuine watch. So again, I think traceability and to prove that you own this piece of uh, property, I think that's going to be useful. And it will also cut down on your cost of like uh, selling the, the property. What, what do you think, Ushbu? I think you are venturing into this space. <laughs> so you probably know more about it than me. I think it, it definitely lowers the overall transaction cost. Um, it does not change much in terms of regulation, if you ask me. There's a lot of regulatory checks that we have to do in the background. And it doesn't matter if we use blockchain or crypto or whatever. From the Securities Commission perspective, we still have to be compliant. It's still considered um, like a security. What it does do is allows us to do a lot of real-time transactions, a real-time um, math and distribution. So it saves on... Um, both effort and it increases accuracy of the transactions because then I don't have to send, send out statements to end customers. Actually, they've been updated on every transaction that has happened. So right now, for example, we would create a PDF, share with our end customers to say, hey, here's what happened. And to be honest, it's my word versus their word. And that's the end of it. But in reality, if we just were to put all of these transactions on blockchain, then they would be able to see that, okay, we sent a repair guy and that cost 200. They will have a complete real-time transparency all the time. And that saves us time, effort, and costs in managing transactions. As far as fractional ownership is concerned, there's a reason why um, companies do not do fractional ownership. It's not just regulatory hurdles. That's one big hurdle. The other hurdle is, if one property, for example, in our case has say 50 investors, that's that's managing 50 different people, getting reports out to 50 different people and so on. And that can be expensive. And so we've done automation for a lot of that, but with blockchain, we could actually make it even simpler, easier and more transparent, which means we can serve not only 50 customers per property, we could actually serve a thousand customers per property and still be okay as a business and not have a huge cost. Of transaction. So for us, I think it's transaction costs, transparency, and uh, making things even faster. Those are the big things that we gain from using something like this. And that's a very important uh, factor because I can, I know that transactions in real estate can be very slow as compared to other financial assets. So yeah, I mean, we can't change the whole industry overnight, one brick at a time, but at least wherever we are involved, we can speed up those pieces and those, those parts for sure. Um, I wish we could change a lot of the uh, supply chain, um, but over time, as more people start, like you were saying, start putting deeds on the blockchain. Like right now, we share a title document. It's in our database and we share it. If it were on actually a blockchain, people could just go validate the veracity of it. Once our lawyer authenticates, you know it is legit. Whatever the customer bought shares of, that's what is there on the blockchain. So it helps us uh, not to have to put things together from 20 different elements and then send out. People can just see it real time. There's definitely a lot of value in the real estate space. Okay, now that we have 10 minutes, we have the most exciting part of the session, which is the NFTs. 
So a lot of people, there's a lot of brouhaha about NFTs, what they are, is it just fake stuff? Why is it valuable at all? Why am I paying for a digital copy of something? It's a big question that most people ask. So uh, Professor Jen, maybe you could tell us why are people paying $17 million for this? Yeah, actually, the answer to that, even I'm not sure I know. <laughs> So this is an example I put up. So this uh, picture just sold for $17 million last month. So uh, this is a digital collection called as Crypto Punks. And this sold for $17 million. And then there's a plot of land in a virtual reality game called Axie Infinity, which sold for $2.5 million, which would be more than price of most of the houses. Uh, maybe you cannot count Toronto there, but but uh, pretty much all the houses in other cities would be less than this price, right? So, so what NFT is that when you talk about Bitcoin, each Bitcoin is the same, it represents the same thing, but NFT is a unique asset. So people are using it for art, they're using it for selling music, they're using it for a virtual reality game. So if you want to look at NFTs, uh, I would suggest you go to this website called opensea.io. So if you click on this website, you can click on explore, and then you can see all the different ways NFTs can be categorized in. So there are art NFTs, there are music NFTs, so music artists are selling their music here. And then in virtual world, you can buy land, so you can have a piece of land in a virtual world and that land only belongs to you. So, uh, so what I see value in right now is uh, one is this virtual games where people are buying lands. And I think more and more people will start to use these lands for meeting. So I'll give you an example here. So, so I definitely don't understand a lot about art. So even if like I had billions of dollars, I'll not pay millions of dollars for Picasso painting. So I'll not do that for the same reason, I'm not going to buy the digital art, but I look for utility. So where, where's the utility in holding something? So, so when you look at the uh, metaverse NFTs, so for example, Decentraland is a game. It's a virtual reality game. And what you can do is you can buy a piece of land in that virtual reality game. And then you can build there. You can build a mall, you can build an office, or you can build a space where events are held. And you can restrict entry to people. Uh, so you can have a ticket for entering, entering. So I think more and more people are going to be playing these virtual games. And you own a piece of land in a virtual game that so many people are playing, millions of people are playing. You can put an ad there for some for your product. So, so recently, for example, I went on this website and I looked at the plot of lands that are available in Decentral Land. So, for example, this piece of land right now you can buy for thirty-two thousand dollars. So, once I buy this land, I can either make it my home. So, whenever I play this game. I can go there and invite my friends and I can meet them at my home. Or I can uh, build a, a experience there or a game there inside this virtual reality game. And those who want to come there and play this game, they have to pay me a fee. So it can generate income for me. Or like recently, there were some artists like Snoop Dogg or Paris Hilton, they had a music festival in this game. So if there's a music festival, you can charge entry tickets. You can have a music festival arena and uh, people go there in, in, in a virtual reality and watch this music festival and they pay, pay a fee for it. So I see at least some utility there over like buying a crypto punks picture for millions of dollars. So, and also Facebook is now also switching to metaverse now, right? So I see some value here, buying a piece of land or are owning assets and these virtual reality games, which people can use. And as more and more people will start using these games, you will see value there. So, um, and also like people say that you can always copy and paste, right? So uh, you can co copy paste a digital image. So, but the advantage here is that on the blockchain, you can see who's the original owner. 
So if you own a Picasso painting, you still have to spend a lot of time on proving that it is the original one. But you don't have to spend time on that for digital art. You can prove it on the blockchain that you are the owner. So that's one advantage of it. And also a lot of artists are actually gaining from this. They are able to sell their music on it or their digital painting on it. And every time it gets resold, they get royalty for, for the resale of their painting or digital art. So that's what I know about it. But I think if you want to explore, uh, you need to go on this marketplace for NFTs, uh, opensea.io and look at, for example, you can type here Decentraland and you go to all the NFTs you can buy on Decentraland and you can see this piece of land somebody is willing to sell for $1.5 million. That's the bid they're expect, uh, they are expecting, but the offer they have right now is $6,000. So the bid will keep on changing. And then you can click on buy now, something that you can buy right away. So right away, you can buy this piece of land for $15,000. So this is what the world is moving to, <laughs> virtual reality. Have you bought anything yet, Professor Jen? So I, I was interested in buying a piece of land last week, but my wife did not let me. So <laughs> that's my story. She thinks I'm taking too much risk and she didn't like the idea of buying land, uh, but in a virtual reality game, but since the time I thought of buying it, it has gone up in value a lot. Already. <laughs> since she is also a finance professor, I would kind of think that maybe there's some merit in, in her risk evaluation. Yeah, yeah. I think we have some questions. So thank you for all of the audience who are contributing to additional information for the rest of the people. Um, but there is some questions also. How does the seller get the ownership of those lands? So the ownership is recorded on the blockchain, so uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. So you will, to buy it, you'll connect your Ethereum wallet and then you will send the money to the owner and the smart contract will transfer the ownership to you. So this each NFT is a smart contract basically. And when you try to buy the NFT, the smart contract changes the ownership to your name. So the ownership goes to your public key and you have access to the private key of the public key. So in the future, you can sell it. Um, also like there are questions on NFT about patent and trademark. So I think for this, you will have to involve the registration office, people who actually do the patent registration. So if they also get involved in it and they are okay with registrations on blockchain, I think then it can happen. But as of now, you cannot just file a patent on the blockchain and you're done with it. That won't work. Um, yeah, so. Right. And then there's another question from Michael. So you can use NFT as an authoritative transaction or document history. Okay, maybe it's not a question. By using NFT, you can publish documents and have an authentic real original document. So I'm not uh, sure about documents here because you can take a document from anywhere, let's say a journal and then make an NFT of it, but you did not write the document, right? So uh, I think only if you are, so for example, digital art, so you are posting it for the first time on, 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 the, on an NFT marketplace. So you can say it as original but document, you have to prove that it was not written before somewhere else. So I'm not sure about how it's going to work for document. Yeah, I guess it's like the uh, Declaration of Independence in the US that um, Nicolas Cage tried to steal in this horrible movie called National Treasure. If there was an NFT version, you would have actually uh, bought it, auctioned it or something of that sort. It's something like that. So if you did have a digital version of any of these documents, then could you make an NFT of it and basically collectively own this? Or no, if that is my understanding weak here. Yeah, I have not thought about documents much really. So uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work. Yeah, but again, 
will somebody pay to buy the original document? I don't know. If I knew that this is the only digital version of the US Declaration of Independence, then maybe yeah. I wouldn't mind being a fractional owner of it, even if it's an NFT fractional ownership. I don't really need the real document. I, that's my thinking. I don't know. It's like owning a painting. So if there's only one digital copy of painting, then would I, would I be up for a fractional ownership of that? Maybe. But again, it has to come from, if it's a Van Gogh, then it has to come from Van Gogh and only Van Gogh can create the digital version of um, the Van Gogh painting. Yeah, yeah. Somebody has mentioned copyright infringement. Only person who can sell copies is the creator, yeah. So only Van Gogh can sell a digital version of his Van Gogh painting, actually. So anybody can create an NFT. The big question is somebody willing to buy NFT. So mm -hmm. like uh, there are so many NFTs available for very cheap, but if you buy them, they won't go up in value. So there are certain digital artists who have built a reputation. So again, if you create a document and there's no one interested in buying it, then there's no point. But if you can do something unique and uh, then people will buy it. Because okay. They can buy it. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was, at least for me, very, very uh, exciting to, to learn all of this stuff. And yeah, I have a lot of questions in my mind and I wish I could learn more. So maybe we will follow it up with a masterclass as there seems to be quite a bit of interest. Um, but thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Professor Jen, um, for, for doing this. Um, thank you so much, Kishpulia. Yeah, before we... Um, before we kind of uh, exit, there's one question that I need to ask people, given that we are talking about investing and I hate to go back to boring stuff, but this is a question on, do you plan to take steps within the next 12 months to help your money work harder to grow? When I, take, when I say take steps, it's not the steps in your mind, it's steps as in, are you actively looking to invest somewhere, put your money somewhere, purchase an asset that will grow, which could be a crypto, um, but just that. This, this was such a good session, I cannot tell you. I'm sure the audience feels the same way. I feel pretty energized, curious, and I can't wait to um, go check out all of the links that you have. Uh, please share the presentation with us so I can make it available to the audience as you have offered. Thank you for that. Um, and then we'll take it from there and, and hopefully we'll find some time to have a follow-up session if you are available. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.